Take it away, Dave. Okay, let, me, uh, let me figure out how to share screens. I actually haven't used this before. Uh, oh, it's actually really easy. OK, uh, can you see my VS code? No. Oh, you can't? Dang it. Not yet. Uh, how does this work? Huh, it says it's claims sharing. Uh, I mean, it, it shows a black screen. Oh, yeah, yeah now. There we go. Yeah. Oh, OK. Uh, I don't know what happened. OK, so the, the mempool's job is basically uh, you, you have, like, you are receiving transactions. You need to broadcast them to the network so that everyone uh, knows about them. And so, like, so then future proposers can propose with these transactions. Uh, like, they, they'd, ideally, they'd reap the uh, transactions with the highest, like, fees. Uh, but currently, we don't sort by fees. So it's just, like, they reap some transactions in their mempool. Uh, so I don't know. I guess my plan for this is just like going through like kind of the five thing or five things that mempool does, and then like maybe going through some of the current issues slash proposals. So the five things it does is essentially you like receive transactions, you broadcast transactions, you receive a block, you uh, broadcast a block, and there's actually only four things. I don't know why I said five. Uh, so for receiving a transaction, you have this like receive method. Uh, and then you you have some bytes, and we use interface decoding to like just figure out what the transaction is, and then we go into the uh, and after we receive it, we go to check TX like right here, and hmm. okay, I'll just go to the side. So we check the transaction. So ideally, what this step is just going to uh, ensure that like the transaction passes signature verification and is like and is correct before adding it to your local list. But because signature ver verification is kind of costly, what we instead do is we build this like LRU cache and uh, and so we try to put it in the cache right here. And then if it like fails, like uh, the, if if it's already in the cache, then we just like skip it because if it's in the cache, it's already, it's already in the mempool. Uh, I guess I'll go through how the cache works. Basically, in the cache, uh, what we do is you, you pass in some bytes to the cache, and then you uh, hash like the transaction, and then you put this transaction hash inside of like inside of a map, and so. When you want to like check, is it already in there? You like take the hash and you like go to the map and say, uh, is does something exist here? And then, uh, if so, you basically say that we're not adding anything new. You and because we're doing a LRU cache, where the idea is you want to remove the uh, when an LRU cache, you basically just want to keep the latest thing. Uh, sorry, you want to remove the oldest things. Like, so if a transaction. Uh, if a transaction came, uh, came and no one's been broadcasting to you, that's the that's the one you want to remove, not the not the oldest one. Or I guess it's kind of minor detail. Uh, uh, does that make sense? Sorry. Yeah. So basically, you know, okay, we, we, we have, have yes. Well, we have this cache that is um, just to uh, lower the amount of um, transactions that actually make it to the application, right? So the mempool can say, oh, I've already seen this, so I don't need to forward this to the application again, right? Uh, and so the cache we're using yeah, is a least exactly. recently used cache because you know, we, we need to put a bound on it. And then if we're putting a bound on it, we need to decide what are we going to remove from the cache if we want to add something new. And so if there's a transaction that we keep seeing, you know, we'll keep that one in the cache. Whereas if there's something we haven't seen for a very long time, it makes sense to let it be removed from the cache. So basically, the oldest thing gets removed, and the cache just takes some of the pressure off of um, the ABC socket. Yeah, yeah exactly. And Continue. if the cache grows too big, then we just like remove the old, remove the old things. Uh, so okay, suppose the tr uh, suppose it was in the cache that or sorry, it wasn't in the cache. Then after that, we write it to the wall file. Uh, I'm actually not entirely sure why we do this. I think it's just because we want to uh, like have a list of transactions in case everything like dies. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So this is purely okay. this is purely okay. like a production backup concern. 
where basically, um, you know, in order, if, say, say some, um, some user or some business or something was running Tendermint uh, in production and, you know, wanted greater guarantees out of the mempool because they didn't want to write very advanced client logic. Um, so basically when a client submits a transaction to a node, the, the wall will ensure that that transaction got written to disk, even if it's not going to get committed in a block yet. And so that way, in the event that all the nodes crash, um, if it weren't for the wall, if it weren't for the write-ahead log, transactions that were just sitting in the mempool would be forgotten about. And so the user, um, you know, we're, talk, we're, we're imagining like a, a non-intelligent uh, client that just submits a transaction once, doesn't wait for it to be completed, and assumes it's going to get in, right? Um, which isn't really the way these systems are designed, like blockchain systems are designed in general. The client kind of has to keep track, and it's up to them to make sure it gets in. Whereas if we want this to work for, um, say, for an enterprise user, we want to make sure that when the cl client submits a transaction, the thing actually gets saved to disk. And then in some crisis scenario where we have to restart, at the very least, we could, we could take that transaction out of the write-ahead log and play it on behalf of the, on behalf of the client. Um, yeah, but right now, we don't actually do anything programmatically with it, and it's just... Um, it's just a performance hit, a pretty significant performance hit. So I think it's off by default. Could it be also related okay. to FIFO guarantees? Uh, to, to which? Uh, FIFO guarantees. We uh, are ensuring. Locally, yeah. I mean, the, the, mempool, the mempool provides the FIFO guarantee um, regardless. Um, with respect to, you mean with respect to like what gets into a block, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this, but you know, the, the mempool can only preserve the, this kind of guarantee locally, right? Because it's not doing um, consensus. So, yeah, this is really just a just convenience and and to avoid data loss under certain conditions where, um, you know, the, the 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 mempool design and the whole system design currently is such that, um, you know, clients have to be intelligent if they want if they want some guarantees. But in order to kind of step around that and make this work in certain settings. Um, the, the right ahead log kind of helps here, but the real solution is a more intelligent client. Does that make sense, Dave? Mm, okay, cool. Yeah, cool. Good to know. So after the wall happens and you receive a transaction, you basically go to the proxy app connection that like Bucky was talking about last Thursday. Hey, uh, you, and it, like, it'll do the check TX. And then uh, there is some global callback so I should have explained this earlier, actually, sorry. Uh, so when we, when we start up the mempool, we create this callback uh, somewhere. Let me try to find where. Uh, right at the bottom there. Oh, right here, right, right here. So this callback uh, is basically, what, okay, whatever. Uh, so right here, basically what we're doing is after every check TX happens, you call this response callback uh, function. And this response callback is actually going to add it to your mempool list. Uh, so we're in the normal case. Uh, I'll go to the other case later. So what's going on here is you have, we have this transaction, and then we see, like, did it pass the ABCI check? Uh, if so, like, that's added to the mempool. Well, and we know it's not already in the mempool because the cache is much bigger than the mempool. Uh, so inside for transactions in the mempool, we give it some extra information. Like we give it the height we received it at and like the gas. Uh, so the height is because when we later go broadcast it, we don't want to broadcast a transaction that like needs a uh, more recent height than the peer is at. And the reason we track gas is because later when we go to build a block as a proposer, you need to uh, use this gas in order to like, determine, can you include it? Because blocks have two, uh, two limits, size and gas. Uh, actually, it's interesting. We probably don't need this for full nodes. Only validators need this. Uh, all right. Yeah, that's a great point. You only need it for full nodes. And so this high thing, I don't understand. Can you explain once more? Uh, sure. So it's actually a little bit like hacky in my opinion, but uh, the idea is when you get a transaction and say like we're at, uh, you log the height at which you're at when you received it. So the idea is that uh, if it passed when you were at height 10, maybe it wouldn't have passed if someone's at height nine. So you're only going to broadcast to people who are at height 10 or greater. Mm -hmm. 
So this is like uh, the reason I said it's a bit hacky is because like well maybe it was valid at height nine. Uh, maybe. So. Okay. Okay, but I see maybe one one way to reason about this is that uh, somehow uh, maybe yeah, but this doesn't make sense also. Uh, if it's committed in, in, in a smaller height, then you don't want to send it after, but I guess then it would also not be there uh, in your oh, map. Yes. Yeah, so later on, we, uh, whenever you receive a block, you remove all transactions that, uh, that are in that block and in your mempool. Mm -hmm. So your mempool will only have transactions that aren't in any block so far. I think that-, that So we constructed this like- This doesn't ensure really anything, uh, in my view. No, it doesn't. So yeah, it's- It gives no like guarantee. Yeah, it's just, um, yeah. Uh, so it may, it may actually not be worth the space cost then because uh, like th that could get quite expensive. Yeah, potentially. I mean, it, I, I think it's just there to prevent, um, to prevent us from sending transactions, like you said initially, to a peer that might not be ready for them, right? Because it depends on some recent height. Um, it's supposed to be the case that the transactions you send to a peer are like work for it. Um, but it's true that, that we don't know, that we don't know if it would actually be valid at an earlier height. So we might just be holding off on sending a pure, uh, a valid transaction. So, um, yeah. Because the semantic between height and the, the, the validity of transaction, it, it, there is no any correlation there. So the right. fact that you receive transaction and, and you're at, at height five doesn't mean anything about that transaction. So right. mm -hmm. at least not at the, at least not at the tenderment level, right? It's possible exactly. that, uh, yeah. Exactly. yeah, yeah. But we are at tenderment level here. Just sure, sure, sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and I'd also point out it's um, having this here and having this condition actually causes the um, the consensus reactor and the mempool reactor to be intertangled because the way the mempool reactor knows about the height, uh, knows about the peer's height, is through the consensus reactor and through the shared data structure under the peer. So this is one of these cases, I think we have an open issue for it, where there's a, this like implicit relationship between the reactors where one reactor expects another reactor to have set some data on the shared data structure in the peer. Um, and that's caused us issues before in tests and in other cases where, you know, it wasn't true. Um, so I think Anton de dealt with a few cases of this before. Um, and we've seen it a few times now. So if we were, if we were limited this height, that would eliminate that, um, that intertangling. So that's something to consider. Cool. Okay, carry on. Okay. Uh, so then our, the, the mempool, the way the mempool stores transactions is uh, it stores them as a linked list. So we add this new transaction, this memtx has been created, and we add it to the back of the linked list. Uh, that's like this line does right here. Uh, I can talk more about the data structure later. I, uh, and then we have this like kind of expensive log right here. So maybe this should be covered to debug mode because when you have lots of transactions, it like actually slows things down a lot. Uh, all right, I want to do for that actually. Uh, then we log some metrics and uh, this, this notified transactions available is just like saying when you're on your broadcast routine, that like, suppose we were stopped. Well, now, now don't stop. Like now keep start your broadcast routine again. And so that's essentially the, uh, oh wait, there's another case. Okay, so this is where the transaction was good. If the, if the transaction was bad, what we do is we remove it from the cache, which uh, the, the idea being like, okay, we're at height 10, maybe a peer at height 11 sent it to us, and like it's valid in block 11, but not in block 10, then uh, we don't wanna like never let this go through. So we're gonna remove it from our, our local cache. This probably, this really does need to be reconsidered though, uh, because the issue is like, as Zarko was saying earlier, like the mempool, the transaction's validity isn't solely like a function of the height. So this means that I can like spam lots of bad transactions at, or the spam the same transaction at you, that's bad. And it'll, you'll keep on like trying to run signature verification on it. So uh, one idea for like how to mitigate this a bit is like make this a bit smarter and look at the ABCI error code. And so if it's like uh, amino decode failed, then uh, then like punish that validate or punish that peer, like 
because uh, no transactions ever fail amino decoding. That's stateless. Uh, likewise, for signature verification, signature verification is only depend on the message bytes. Uh, well, actually, no, that's, not, that's not true. Signature verification. Uh, so, but maybe we can do some more. Uh, check more uh, information about ABCI codes to, like, so that we can't be spammed with the same transaction over and over again. Yeah. Uh, this is a really good point. And I think we, we also have an open issue for this, but we never really um, went any further with it. But uh, it might be something that we could, because um, we have to be careful on what codes, you know, because if, if the codes influence the, in, the behavior in the mempool, it means it's another, uh, it's another thing that, like, the developer has to be aware about, the application developer, right? So, um, you know, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe this is somewhere where we use the code space, potentially, and the code space can somehow indicate that this is a, you know, the transaction failed some kind of stateless verification so that it should be rejected from the mempool. Um, or we could just try to better distinguish kind of standard code types. The problem right now is that there's no, um, there's no standard on the code types other than code zero is okay, right? So none of the other codes mean anything mm -hmm. specific as far as the Tendermint or ABCI specification. So if we were going to, um, if we were going to make the mempool depend on the code type, then we have to update the ABI spec. So uh, it, yeah. it's, it's almost certainly something we're going to need to do, but we just need to be careful about exactly how we do it. Maybe what we could do is like we could have one set of codes be stateless and then like one set of codes be uh, stateful. And so the mempool will only react on stateless failures. Yeah. But, but would, you, would you do that by adding another code field or by using the code type or, or code space or reserving yeah. you know, some, some fields, I mean, some uh, values from the code? Now, it's probably open issue or open, uh, not not a simple problem. Maybe we should discuss on GitHub later. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, sure. So there's an open issue for it, so we can take it up there. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Uh, okay. So the next thing, uh, when you want to broadcast transactions. Uh, oh, actually, does that make sense? That's like, uh, any questions about how you, what happens when you receive a transaction? Okay. So I'll go to broadcasting then. Uh, broadcast. Okay, there's this like broadcast transaction routine. Uh, so the idea is we iterate through our mempool linked list per peer. Here's so this first condition is saying, okay, uh, is there anything left to send to this peer? Uh, and then if so, then continue. So first we get the next uh, transaction, the mempool linked list. Then we see, uh, is the peer, like, can we give it to the peer? Uh, and if so, like, is the height, uh, is the peer, peer's height, uh, like, higher than the mempool's, mem mempool transaction's height? And then if so, uh, then we can send, send the mempool transaction. And then uh, we have some, like, timeouts and, like, we keep waiting until there's another transaction in the mempool. Uh, so Bucky has like a, a open issue, but uh, for this, and uh, is that like we should batch these mem these memtx sends because like there's a high latency to sending. So it's we get a much more efficient thing if you, you send like I don't know maybe ten transactions at once instead of just one at a time. So that's something we should like eventually do. Yeah, this is a uh, yeah. This I think this should be a relatively uh, easy fit, like uh, kind of feature uh, to add here. Uh, but I also would uh, like uh, similar to the previous discussion said that this stuff like uh, like that the peer height uh, from the mempool point of view is irrelevant stuff. And so mm -hmm. uh, at a consensus level, it makes sense that we are doing this check. But at the mempool uh, at a consensus reactor level. But at a mempool level, we just want transaction to propagate to the network as fast as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. so, the, so checking uh, that we reach a height to pass transaction further uh, might be wrong. Uh, especially because we are sleeping here, you know, we don't do anything. Uh, so why not, you know, if you have bandwidth, why not just pushing transaction around? Uh, yeah, I, I agree we should probably send it, but but it is a bit complicated because like we also want to punish peers with transactions that didn't verify. Because like if you sent me a transaction and it was like garbage, then uh, I want to disconnect from you as a peer or like punish you as a peer. 
So yeah, this, yeah, but this is this is sort of um, we we need to figure this at a different level. So yeah, the, but I, so for me in general, I was never thinking about this check TX as something very uh, stateful. But apparently, some application application are using it that way. So uh, every account based thing should be stateful because uh, you're checking your account number and sequence number. And in order to do that, you need to uh, how do you say? Uh, you need to like go query state and say what is this account's account number and what is this account's sequence number. Yeah. Yeah. So so ba basically, uh, uh, like the simple solution would be to be to have some kind of lightweight check TX, like uh, which we just look for the format. But you're right that we also don't want to. Uh, to have like the, some old transaction which now will not pass, just uh, being propagated to the network. So uh, maybe what we could do is we could say we could have a transaction carry all the state it needs to be verified at the mempool level, and so uh, like you could carry your account number and stuff, and then what you do is. You like you say, okay, I assume the stuff you said is correct. Let me verify if it's true then. And then, uh, and so you, it's like you verify those signatures. And like, if that data is wrong, then you punish the peer. And then you do the stateful checks. That, like to ensure that data that was provided yeah. was actually correct. Yeah, well, for, for example, when you submit transaction, you might be, uh, yeah, but this would be kind of done here, yeah. like the current height. I don't know. Like we probably want to, to formalize here what we really want to assure and then to see what are the options because this seems like a hack. Like we just check the mm -hmm. height and then we do something or not do, but it's not really clear uh, whether like, does it really help? And it seems that it yeah. might have some negative uh, uh, influence on performance. So uh, yeah, it definitely really inhibits the broadcast rate. Yeah. And the semantic, we really need to figure out a bit better on this. Maybe the opcodes are the way to go so that, you know, we can have a different level of uh, way to pass uh, the, the application semantic with this different opcode and then somehow this could influence mempool. So uh, we need to think a bit more about this. Yeah, for sure. Maybe like, uh, maybe some of the stateless verification things that a lot of blockchains have been working on could be applicable. Okay, uh, I'll carry on with like what we do when we receive a block. Uh, this is called our like, update function. Oh, uh. okay. So when we want to, when we receive a block, we essentially the goal here is we want to remove all transactions from uh, for which the uh, that were included in the block. And we also have like when proposing, or sorry, oh I skipped this earlier. So when you receive a transaction, you have a function, post check function. Uh, sorry for skipping this. I, I guess I didn't see lines. Uh, so backtracking, when you receive a, tra a transaction, you want to check that like the number of bytes it has is like is not bigger than the block before you pass it to check TX. So that's what this like pre check function does. And similarly, like when you once you check the transaction. You want, to bear, you want to ensure that the, like, the amount of gas it takes is also not bigger than the block gas limits. So this like post check function does that as well. So like when you receive a transaction, you run the pre check before going through the caches, and then you run the post check after you've gotten back check TX. And so in this update function, since these are basically based off of block size, we have to uh, update these in, in case like consensus change those consensus params. So uh, once you receive a block, then we, what we first do is like we add all these transactions we just received into our cache, just so that because now since they're already they've already been in a block, we uh, we no longer need we no longer need to uh, keep on keep them keep accepting them if a peer sends them. But actually, there may be an issue here because if a invalid transaction is sent, then uh, you would have to then like it would never be able to be sent again. Like IE like suppose like this suppose this transaction would be valid in the in the subsequent block, but not in the current block. And it's included like maliciously in the current block, we'll never repropose it. So uh, at least until it gets emptied from the cache. Yeah, which 
may or may not be a while. Right, right. Yeah, that's a great point. So we should only add transactions to this cache that passed in the deliver TX. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we basically just remove the transactions. Uh, so the way you remove the transactions is, uh, is a kind of inefficient. We make like a map of uh, strings to transactions, like empty struct basically. Uh, and we essentially, like we uh, were using, but we then like put every single transaction in the block into the, like into this map. And then we, we iterate through the mempool and say like, okay, is this transaction in the map? If so, that means like, okay, it was in this latest block. And so we should remove it. The reason I say this is inefficient is just because we're doing a string conversion and like a hash conversion, uh, which I don't know, may or may not be expensive, but also may not be worth optimizing. I don't know, uh, to, to consider in the future. And so basically that's how the update function works. I don't know if I go through that too fast. Basically like we're, this whole chunk is just checking if the transaction exists in this, in the set we've transacted. Sorry, this block is saying, iterating through the mempool and saying like, does the mempool TX exist in the list of transactions that we just got in the latest block? If so, remove it from the mempool. Otherwise, uh, keep going. Oh, actually we have the same issue here too for uh, ensure the transaction is valid before doing, before removing it. Okay, uh, does that make sense? Uh, sounds good. Okay, I'll, so the final step, uh, reaping a block. Uh, what about the so recheck? we have this like mutex. So, sorry. What about the recheck? Oh, uh, oh, wow, you're right. Whoops. Uh, wait, where does recheck happen? Oh, right here. An update. Uh, so we move the transactions, and then we do this like really inefficient thing. Uh, we go, we iterate through the entire mempool again, and we say on every transaction we say like we check it again in order to ensure that like it's still correct. So that, that alone isn't actually like a bad thing. The, the, the bad thing is that we, we redo all signature verifications, which ends up being very costly. So the reason we have to recheck is because like, I don't know, suppose there's two transactions with the same sequence number, and then uh, one of those gets, gets committed in the block. We want the other one to be removed from the mempool, so we don't have to rerun it again. So, and we also recheck it because one kind of, Cool thing about our mempool is since we have a, we keep it as a linked list and we, in, so we, we're ensuring that the transactions, if they're included in the order as of this linked list, they will, they'll, they'll pass all together. But, uh, that also has like some kind of weird, or, uh, or not weird. It, it slows down this process because it also means we can't paralyze these, these rechecks. So when we go to recheck, we the way we do it is let me find the recheck code. Uh, reach. Okay. So the way we way we check it is like we have this we kind of have this uh, mempool cursor and we just check them one by one and we have we have this happen in order it's like synchronously. There's no parallelization. So when we receive it when we have the callback, the callback will instead call this. Uh, Recheck res cb read. Uh, so we essentially like ensure that the statement, the sorry, the apps and them back in order. So that's what this like recheck cursor is doing. If they're not in order, we panic and like tell the app they're doing it wrong. Uh, then we have this. We have again have this post check thing, which is again just checking at the gas that it says it should. Uh, the gas isn't bigger than to total block gas size. And if the transaction is now bad, we delete it from the mempool. And remove it from the cache because it may be good later. Though actually, I'm not entirely sure. Like, would a thing that's been 
bad that was previously good and is now bad, will will that become good later? It's possible. Sure. Okay. It could be bad based Certain on apps the have arbit that. arbitrary conditions in the state, right? So who knows? Yeah, you're right. It could be bad if like block hash is, ends in a zero byte or something. Exactly. Yeah. Well, because it's Monday, or you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's how the rechecking thing works. Uh, does that make sense, or? Yeah. So do you think there's uh, there's places that can be improved, or? Oh, totally. So I actually think this recheck method is not the. I think that the there's a structural problem of the entire mempool. So uh, I guess I can talk about that now. That's like the four basic functionalities. Oh no, no, we uh, we have reap left. I guess I'll talk about reap, and then we can talk about I guess the structural flaw. Okay, great. Uh, reap. Okay, so reap is a saying like uh. The consensus will say like I want to give me a block or give me a set of transactions that are up to this many bytes and up to this much gas. Mm -hmm. And you, what you do is you iterate from the front of the mempool to like uh, until the point where one of these conditions no longer holds, and you just return those transactions. Uh, this all this only looks like non-trivial because we have to compute the amino overhead. It's like transactions are computed with uh, like amino encoding, but they're kept in the mempool as raw bytes. But if that wasn't the case, then this would be really simple, I promise. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that was a, we paid out a bug bounty for that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's free. Uh, I guess I'm now I can go talk to the structural flaw, I think. So sure. the issue is uh, we have this, like, the entire thing is a linked list, and we have lots of locks everywhere. So it being a linked list means, like, or our guarantee in the mempool is that the first n transactions or the first n transactions in the linked list will work together when composed as a check TX. So this means that like we have to we can't parallelize too much. Like when I go to recheck transactions, I can't just give the app all of them parallel and like get them out of order or and then re receive responses separately. I have to wait for like one to finish one after another, which is a huge slowdown. And, and like prevents the mempool from like for, for friends rechecking from being quick. And Sorry, what do you mean it has to wait for one to finish? Uh, because we, our guarantee in the mempool at the moment is that like, all of these transactions work. Uh, when you go to reap them, you can just take the first N, yeah. and they'll, work, they'll all pass check text together. Yeah. So, so it's sent in order, but it's we'll be synchronously, right? Like we don't uh, wait for one I to think finish we'll processing before we send the next. We do if it's in process. Oh, right? we do currently. Like yeah. we have a we have a comment saying you could just not do this, but uh, there's no a way to change that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So we we need to. Um, uh, we talked about this. Um, I think at the last session, right? That the the in process ABCI client mm -hmm. is actually strictly synchronous. So if we made yeah. that synchronous, then then that would fix this. Uh, not fully though. The the guarantee we still have. Is that they, these first ones work in order? Yeah. And um, we were actually we have lots of locks on uh, all these transactions as well. So like when I go to reap, I I'm locking the entire linked list. Uh, when I add a transaction, I'm actually locking the entire linked list as well until I get the response. It's not even the response like does its own lock. So even if we're in the asynchronous case, we still have to wait, or Ooh. maybe just it doesn't work in the asynchronous case. I, not sure. How's that? Where? How do we hold the lock until we have the response? Uh, we lock, then we have a def we defer the unlock. Uh, oh, I yeah. guess actually in the async, if it's properly async, then we actually yeah. just don't lock here. Yeah. And this shouldn't be a huge. So the way our mempool is is like I believe the transactions are a. Uh, they're what we call a concurrent linked list. Yeah. This is a lie. It is actually a linked list with a mutex on every single node. Uh, this is, so uh, you can't have multiple of these adding, uh, like you can't, if you have multiple, even in the async mode, if multiple of these things were ending at the same time, they would have a contention and like you'd have delays. So instead what I think we need to do is change this linked list to be a, a different data structure that is concurrency safe, 
So like you could, or sorry, concurrent with no locks. So you could instead like add these multiple transactions without uh, in a lock-free manner. These like exist. Uh, there's a, uh, and so by doing that, we could like eliminate this contention between different check TXs. And then instead, we want the guarantee that when you go to reap, you have this. Um, when you go to reap, you have the first n transactions already verified that they work together. We instead build like a sort of thread on the side of these, like on the side of the main mempool, and this thread would be the, the transactions with the highest uh, fees or highest priority. But how do you know those are going to work in the right order? Uh, so uh, it's part of the thread. So like the thread. Uh, so I guess, let me backtrack one sec. The transactions data structure I'm, I'm proposing that's like lock free is also sorted. So we'd have it sort by fee or sort by like fee uh, per amount of work ratio or something. Yeah. Uh, then we have, then we start building up this thread of the highest re reward ones, regardless of whether we're uh, when we're going to propose next or not. So right. like, and we build this thre uh, thread up until it reaches the maximum size. Yeah. And we we keep verifying in that within that thread that like every these all work together. I see. So, so we're running we go to propose, again. Like, so we run check TX again on those transactions to make sure that they're valid in that order. Yeah, on these high value transactions. Right. So you get so you get the sorted order of the highest value. You take the highest one. You run check TX, and then you take the next one. You run check TX. If it fails, you'll leave it for later. Try the next one, and so on. Yeah. Right. So currently, this locking is actually a really big problem, in my opinion, because I can't. If I send you, if I have a peer sending you a, a, a hundred different transactions at once or you have multiple peers sending you different transactions, yeah. you can't do any, like they're complete, you can't do anything while with the 99 of them. You can only handle one at a time. Yeah. Which kind of blocks, if you have expensive signatures, like in BLS transactions, a single transaction is kind of costly. Yeah. So it's like, this blocks the mempool from being useful. Yeah. We have a separate problem due to these locks as well, which I was open to issue like I think yesterday, or I don't know when. Uh, that like every since every all these check TXs are claiming a lock on the mempool. All of the reaps claim a lock on the mempool, and the uh, we it's now the case that uh, when the when you want to propose, you have to fight all these check TXs for your uh, ability to propose. Yeah. So uh, I can like add thousands of check TXs here, here and uh, then when I want to propose, I have my one like mutex has to go fight these other thousand. Yeah. And uh, and the signature verification time, like just keep in the back of your head, I guess, for sec P is about 250 microseconds. So if the mempool's like size is uh, like 5,000, that ends up being like one point something ish seconds in, uh, to verify these check TXs. Yeah. So uh, we end up that like, and since you can keep on, you can continue to keep spamming them, you can like, you can keep on increasing or the number of check TXs like, check TX threads doesn't actually decrease. So it's still going to be hard for you to reap, like no matter what, because there's no prioritization. But the reap, the reap isn't competing with the transaction completing. It's only competing with it getting started, right? Because the lock is only- uh, In the synchronous assuming, case, it is- Yes, in the synchronous case. But assuming the, assuming the ABCI client was properly asynchronous. Yeah. So the, it sounds yes, like we definitely, this be, this would we not definitely be a problem. need to fix that. Or go with the new yeah. mempool design, which might be valuable regardless. I think the mempool design, like the new one's just better in general. Yeah, sure. Because uh, you also you get sorting for free. Yeah. You can't really do sorting in the linked right. list. Cool. Uh, I guess I can go through the issues then. Uh, oh, I guess you can't see my. Can I? Is it possible for me to change like the screen? I think so. I don't know exactly okay. how, but. Maybe you have to unshare first. Does anyone have any questions, by the way? Uh, let's see this. Can you see Firefox or GitHub? No. no. Not yet. Uh, the screen is turning green oh, here. No. <laughs> <laughs> now there's a browser. Looks like Firefox. Okay. And get up in a dark cool. scheme. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so this mempool lock things thing I just mentioned, and uh, I, I have some numbers in that, in that particular issue, and so I think like you can probably delay consent, uh, the reap by seconds if you tried. Yeah. Uh, then switch hash up to tree map. Oh, uh, this is kind of minor. Probably not worth spending time on. Uh, this interface and encoding mempool messages. When basically when we go to broadcast, instead of like broadcasting the actual bytes, we're we're converted to an interface which has only one implementer, and this uh, and so this adds like an unnecessary four bytes of overhead on every single gossip. Uh huh. Which is a bit silly. Yeah. Uh, What's the interface? What, what Amino. Interface? The yeah, yeah, mempool, yeah. mempool message type, right? Oh, okay. Every consensus reactor defines its own type yeah. because most of them have more than one message, except yeah. this one only has one. Same with the evidence pool. I think it also only has one. The thing is, though, like the nice thing about, about using the interface is that we can add a new type, right? So if we add, if we want to add the batching. But right, you can always. I guess we could add that all in one type, too. Just ignore uh, the first field, right? Yeah. Okay. And we can also just add new messages. So the issue with like uh, Amino here is that in PDP sensitive things, that's a four byte overhead, whereas really the one byte email, or you have to use the four byte overhead. Yeah. Yeah, it would be nice if it was, uh, I mean, only one byte, at least with, you know, the nice thing about having at least one byte is that it's uh, somewhat future proof, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, you can always borrow into code, so it's seven bits, and you can get you can get more than one byte. Sure. Okay. Then the next thing, uh, validate full box. Uh, actually, I don't know what this is. Do you know what this is, Bucky? Oh, this is a test. Okay. Maybe I guess we don't. Oh, this is what caused the mempool bug. Uh, oh, yeah. When we had the mempool bug, yeah. we didn't actually like yeah. try running it through consensus to see if it didn't work properly. Yeah. We just uh, we just had the mempool test to, to test what we thought it thought it did. Yeah. Okay, right in ADR for the mempool thread thing. So I was saying earlier that we build up one thread at a time, or like of this, these highest value transactions, but it's actually not clear that's optimal. So because you may have that, like, uh, suppose that you, have, you can only have 100 transactions, and, like, the first 99, uh, you, or you've already filled a thread, maybe, and you get a new transaction that's, like, uh, that has more fees and everything else. Then you, you may want to, like, pop off the last thing of your thread and add this new, like, this new highest value thing. Yeah. But then you may have an issue that in the subsequent block, uh, maybe you invalidated, like, maybe half of your thread. So do you have to go re? Uh, you you may want to already have another backup thread like created before, uh, like, uh, instead of just like and abandon your current one. Hmm. Or there's like lots of different ways to do uh, return error when wall. The next issue, I guess, is like returning error when wall fails. Uh, not that big. Allow nodes from without mempool. Distinct from the actual mempool design. Oh, mempool caching. So, uh, in the when we had the cache, I was saying we did we did a SHA two fifty six hash of the bytes we're throwing into the mempool cache. I didn't explain why that was the case. The reason we do that is because uh, if we just had the mempool cache have the, the entire bytes, I could just make really large trans transactions and like adversarially fill up your cache such that it was like it it was massive. So instead, what we do is uh, we do a SHA-256 thing to give a truncated version. And, uh, but instead, we, we don't really need a cryptographically secure hash here. You, you could instead use something that's like very nice, and we're, it's not known to have collision problems, but it's not crypt considered cryptographically secure. So that's like what this is proposing. Basically, the actual hash is called highway hash and uses like SIMD to be really fast and nice. Uh, it's may it actually may not be worth doing that in long term if we can instead use that SHA-256 hash on the cache and like we, we send a hash with the transaction to avoid recomputing that later. So that, that could actually offset the cost. So worth considering. Sending the uh, hash with the transaction? Yeah, so like when you go to the, uh, when, when you reap it, maybe you give all the transaction hashes as well. And, oh, I see. Yeah. And so 
in consensus, you don't have to recompute those when building your Merkle tree. Uh, that might be my compromising. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so if so, then we should just use the faster hash. Fair enough. Uh, punish peers that return certain codes. Okay, so back to what we were talking about earlier. Like, yeah. if it's just decoding fails, then there's no excuse. Yeah, they just did it wrong. Uh, changing a data structure. Yeah, this is the same like parallelism things. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else interesting here. Uh, Could we consolidate uh, that with the other with the other one? The thread one. Yeah. Uh, actually, Exla did the opposite because he wanted like I don't know. He, I think he wanted an ADR for that, whereas the other one was just still discussion mode. Okay, sure, that's fine. Uh, then adding a recheck TX function. Uh, so earlier I was saying rechecks check all six verifications. This is very unnecessary. You can instead just have that. You can just say like, okay, assume the signatures are already verified. Let's skip the signature verification. So now these new check when we're rechecking the everything in the mempool is now very fast. Yeah. And so the fear is like, okay, what if pub keys change? Well, if pub key changes, then like the app can figure that out. Like the app should be able to tell did the pub key change uh, recently and then uh, still verify signatures. So the idea here is to like add a flag to the check TX. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that could be that could be a valuable change to the ABCI though. I think we should we need to accumulate a, a list of proposed improvements to ABCI and have some kind of workshop or design session to figure out what should get integrated. And... Yeah. Um, that actually, I think it'd be really useful to do in like maybe in the near term as well. Cause, or, uh, actually, I don't know how that matters in the relation to launch. I think it's independent. Okay. It doesn't break the blockchain, right? Yeah. Okay. Then the remaining of these is uh, the way transaction broadcasting is basically just like we should batch them, I think. Oh, no, no. Sorry. This is the thing I have an open issue for or open PR open for. Open PR for, yeah. Yeah. So uh, basically, what's going on is like when we send a transaction, if I send it to you, then you may resend it back to me, which is very silly. <laughs> um, uh, so instead, we should like have the, the uh, mempool keep track of which peers sent it to them. So the, I guess the way I do it in the PR is basically like have them add peer IDs to the mempool TX. And when you go to submit, um, when you go to send it, you have the mempool, uh, just make sure that the, the peer isn't in that mempool TX list of known, isn't in the list of peers that sent that transaction to you. Uh, the PR is also like a bit non, like it's a bit more complicated because we have to do some annoying things with the callbacks. But uh, that ends up basically just means that we set the callback per re re response request instead of having a global callback. Right. Great. Uh, yeah, I think that's all the issues. Oh, I guess maybe it might be worth talking about the latest issue a bit more for the adversarial delay. Because we could also get around this by removing that lock on when you reap. Because reaping technically doesn't, uh, doesn't mutate the mempool. And it's actually not a huge deal if the re if the mempool is like getting things appended to it from check TX while you're still reaping. So that just means you get more transactions in your reap. The question the question I guess is where do you stop? If so that would also fix that less. huge like contention problem. Yeah, the the question is where do you stop if you have less than the max size for a block? And do you keep waiting for new transactions? Normally, it's, yeah. I guess you could just check and the size. stop at the end. Start. Right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that was. So that be... could also fix this current, this latest problem. Cool. Now we should look at that. That's any, great. Any other questions anyone has in the mempool or like things you want to discuss? That was really great. Looks like uh, it was a great presentation. Thanks, Dave. There's a, a lot of um, a lot of good open issues. A few that I think are pretty low hanging fruit that could probably make a significant difference. At least one. You know, you already have an open PR for, so we'll look to get that merged. Uh, cool. 
and there's probably a few others that might you know might be worth benchmarking to see if they're really worth it like you know yeah. hash and stuff but, <laughs> <laughs> some of the some of the, some of these are going to require larger um, larger design sessions to really flesh out how we want to do it but mm -hmm. um, yeah otherwise great presentation yeah anyone else have any cool. questions nope. cool. If there's one you should take a look at, I would highly recommend the change data structure issue. I think yeah. that, that's a really interesting way and would solve a lot of these problems at once. Awesome. All right, cool. we'll take a look. Thanks a lot, Dave. Great presentation. Thanks. We'll see everyone online. See Bye you guys. next Monday. Thank you got you. it. Yeah. Cheers. Cool. See ya. Bye. Bye. Bye.